Welcome back to another episode of the B2B Founder Podcast, where we help founders and business owners grow their companies from zero to 10 million. I'm your host, Brett Trainer. David Premier is back on the podcast. If you recall, he was guest on episode number 55, so almost, well, actually over a year ago. David is the best-selling author of Sell the Way You Buy, a modern approach to sales that actually work, and is the founder of Cerebral Selling. We chat today about the science behind selling and how to leverage that to improve your conversion rates, reduce sales cycle time, and increase your average deal size. And the key is, by the way, not discounting. A couple of the other topics we discuss are being consistent with your mission and vision will get you further, how to move from features and benefits to problem solving. This is a big one. Think about how you can sound different. Tips for making that discovery call. You don't have to overcome all objections. And another key insight is what a customer tells you isn't exactly what the objection is about. Man, this was a highly actionable conversation that you can apply today. You know, like I said, if you're stuck with your sales, whether you're founder-led or transitioning to a sales team, this is the conversation for you. At the end of this, please make sure you visit our website where you can find the show notes plus the links mentioned with David. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe so you're always the first to know when a new episode is released. Now, let's get the interview started. Hey, David, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back with you, Brett. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's crazy. I looked it up. You were episode 55, which now this will probably be around 110, so almost a year to the date <laughs> since we had this last conversation. I think we were just starting to understand the magnitude of what the pandemic looked like. And so I'm like, this is a perfect time to have you back on and talk about by selling, founder-led selling and growth organizations, how to approach it, because I still find many companies doing this wrong. So long-winded intro <laughs> to welcome you back, but, uh, but I'm excited to have you here. But before I, we get into the topic, if you could kind of remind the audience a little bit about your background and, and what you're working on today. Yeah. So my name is David Premer. I'm the founder and chief sales scientist, as I say, of Cerebral Selling. Like all of you, like I'm an entrepreneur trying to grow my business. My primary business is sales training and speaking. But I started my career over 20 years ago as a research scientist, like all of us. We all ended up in sales by accident. Even those of us as entrepreneurs, like we didn't go to school for entrepreneurship. We all have a journey. That was mine. And I ended up joining at the turn of the dot-com boom out of my research scientist uh, career, a startup as a sales engineer and absolutely fell in love with sales. And over the course of the next 20 years, I was a part of four awesome high growth B2B uh, tech startups. Uh, three ended up being acquired. One was acquired, a company I helped, I helped start in 2008 uh, by Salesforce, came over to the ship with Salesforce and spent five awesome years there seeing how the sales machines were built operationally and culturally at scale. But after all this time, I couldn't think of anything better to do with the better the second half of my career than to teach the art and science of modern selling because it's so nuanced, it's so beautiful, it's so difficult. And the world of buying has changed so much. So that's that's what I do today. Yeah, man, that may be the best thumbnail and <laughs> over you that, that we've had. <laughs> it's interesting. So you've proven just how easy it is to grow and scale businesses with four companies, three exits. It's it's that easy, right? It's just- Oh yeah, you know, just sale. yeah, you build a website, people come to it, a couple of clicks and bada bing, there you're done, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so I think that's the, the perfect lead in, you know, Salesforce kind of revolutionized the, what we call the modern selling with a lot of inside sales, the tools that they had. And I think we're even seeing a shift post, right? The inside sales movement to the, the way you used to sell doesn't work anymore. Even three years ago, I think we still had bad tactics and, and strategies and you wrote a book on it. So one highly encourage folks, I don't know if you have a copy, you can show up in front. I should have, Here we you know, go. I, there it is. Sell the way you buy. So intuitive. It makes sense. You know, and I told you offline that I reread it in, in, in advance of our conversation today. I'm like, Oh, Crap. Yeah, that's right. I forget. I'm not even doing some of these things that, that you outline in there. So why I wanted to have you back is one of the, the biggest, the two stats, we talked a little bit offline is right. 99 out of hundred companies don't get to 10 million, but only one out of 10 actually get to a million. So for today's episode, I think there's more companies that should be able to get to that million dollar mark. 
but they struggle with sales, right? Or getting revenue. And, and what I found, I'd love to see hear your experience is a lot of that founder-led selling is selling through passion, right? Their belief in the product, selling into their network. So there's more friendly folks, but I still find a lot of them struggle with the inefficiencies or the ineffectiveness, even with, within that network. So maybe before we kind of dig into how you would recommend founders to, to approach this, you know, talk about the, the high or the how and the why, why and the how of, of buyers are purchasing today. Because I think to better understand that, we'll give folks a better idea of how and why you should approach the sales process. For sure. You know, there's kind of two things. When you think about building a sales machine at a company, there's kind of the operational bit, which is okay, how many sales reps should I have? And should we, territories, and what roles should I have a business development person? Like, we're not going to talk about that today. The other piece, which is, in my view, the most important and, and the thing that a lot of people overlook is what do people say when they speak to a customer? <laughs> like the kind of the, the hand-to-hand combat. Like, what is it that you say you do in your business? How do you handle objections? Like, how do you get customers to open up about their needs in an environment where there's a million solutions. I mean, I, we all think that we're this like unique, like delicate snowflake, yep. but there's a million people that do what you do, what I do, what, what your listeners do. So that's the thing that a lot of people overlook and the thing that founders really need to focus on. But when you think about like, well, so what's changed in the last five, 10 years? So there's, there's two things. I mean, certainly the way people buy kind of emotionally has remained kind of consistent, but our knowledge, our insights around how people actually make purchasing decisions has become more mature. So it used to be, for example, you know, in sales, we would always try to like corner the customer, you know, hey, is there any reason why you couldn't make a decision today to move forward with this product? We would use these kind of old school kind of high pressure tactics. We would focus on, you know, our products and the features and benefits and all that kind of stuff. And the reality is we now realize and learn with much greater clarity that that's actually not how people buy. Like people make decisions, not just purchasing decisions, but decisions in their everyday lives based on emotion. And we know this, you know, it's been scientifically proven. And a lot of this science and buying behaviors and patterns has come out a lot of research in recent years around why, what motivates people to buy the specific emotional drivers, how to link your marketing to these emotional motivators. So that's like the number one thing, like we've learned now how people buy, but also the marketplace kind of, as I alluded to, is far different than it used to be. And one of the statistics that I quote in the book is if you look at just, for example, marketing technology, in 2011, there were 150 vendors in the marketing technology space. And if you fast forward now, when the book came out, I only had the 2019 statistics, but in in 2020, there were over 8,000 vendors in the marketing technology space. And in fact, not just more vendors, but there was a lot more nuance to what these marketing technology vendors could do. You know, you've seen things like revenue operations and conversational intelligence, like that stuff didn't exist five years ago, right? And so now when you go to market and you have this like newfangled idea, it's actually, you know, more difficult to explain to customers, what is it that you do in a well-differentiated way? Because they'll look at you and they'll say, hold on a second, that, I, that sounds similar to what this other company does, I heard. And then you're going to say, oh, no, 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 like they do this really well and we do this really well. And to your customers, like they just don't care don't about care. what it is that you do. Yeah, 100%. You had a good example in the book about a sales rep. You actually got on the phone with the buyer. The buyer asked the sales rep, so what does your company do? Couldn't answer it, right? And that, and that should be like 101. But I know that's really hard for a lot of people to even think about and articulate You know what you do. And at that point, you've lost the confidence of the buyer. And so, yeah. And I, the other thing I really like about your book and the way you lay, laid out is you just mentioned founder just heard what you said and like, oh my God, I have to deal with marketing technology and emotions and all these things. It's good to understand it, but to be effective, you don't have to right, go that deep to be, be effective. If that makes sense what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, you know, it's true. And it, what's interesting is we talk about like founder led selling. Yeah. I actually find there are, are two kinds of founder led selling. The first kind is the one kind of like the engineering mindset, the product mindset, where they created this amazing product. Like they're not a sales or marketing person and they've absolutely fallen in love with the product and its beauty and the nuance and the algorithms and all that kind of stuff. And they go out and they sell that and they don't understand why other businesses don't love their product as much as they do because they're really focused on like the nuance of the, uh, you know, the nuts and bolts of what it does. And then there's kind of like the, the business led founders or the sales and marketing founders 
who aren't as concerned with the nuance of like what the, what the product does, right? And in a way, they actually do a better job of kind of leading with the pain. They lead with the belief. They lead with the mission. And especially, you know, if you're growing a company, the reality is that your product will probably change a number of times, will iterate a number of times over the course of the, the building of that product in that company. But the thing that probably won't change is your mission, you know, is the why, is the belief. And so, you know, being more consistent about moving forward with those belief statements and the mission and the vision will actually get you farther in terms of growing your company. And as well, you know, when you think about you're trying to build a business and you have a product, like that product may not work as well as you'd like it to on the first or second or third iterations as you're trying to get to a million dollars. And so there's a good chance that your clients will have some challenges, some, some turbulence, some blemishes. And if they have fallen in love with your product, you won't really get as many chances as you need to, to kind of fix that relationship. Right. But if they've fallen in love with your mission, your values, you know, imagine like you're, you're going through a marriage and your marriage hits a rough spot. What do you do? You take a step back and you say, honey, you know, remember, remember 10 years ago when we first got together, like we were these, you know, wide eyed kids, like we're still those people, right? Like you come back to the values because the values are what yeah. gets you through it. It's not the product. And so there's definitely those two types of founder led sales. And I would definitely bias towards the more kind of like the vision, the, the belief driven sales, if you want to have more longevity in your message. Yeah, no, 100%. All day long, I take the folks that are passionate about the why they're doing what they're doing and how they think they're changing it versus, you know, this new features and benefits. Because, you know, the reality is two or three years ago, it would take a company, you know, 12, 18 months, two years to copy, right, your tech and what you're doing. But man, today's day and age, it's probably less than three months, these companies could re-engineer what you've done. And so if your whole go to market is these features and benefits, it's going to be copied. And so, you know, that's kind of where I like, and I remind, you know, founders to start, don't start the sales process, start back at the kind of the messaging and the positioning. And I have, I've come around more recently to the, the power of the why, right? It used to be, you know, the problem that you solve for the customer, right? How you solve it differently, the differentiation, and then why are you solving? It was never, I didn't think, cause I, you know, 30 plus years in and out of enterprise, you do your job, you sell, you're solving this problem. But now it's becoming, at least maybe the podcast is illuminated. The fact of a lot of these high growth companies, especially in B2B, are all why driven, right? It's it's part of it. It's the people they're recruiting are, are getting behind the mission and they're doing it. I think the other mistake folks make is they think they have to be you know, solving world hunger or some massive global change with their mission, but it's not, right? It's just got to be something that's going to be impactful to the customers that the customers can can buy into. So, so maybe that would be a good, you kind of pivot and not pivoted, you let us right into, hey, before you go make that first sales call, really think about your messaging and positioning. So what's, what's kind of your recommendation to a founder to, I know there's going to be iterations, but what's a good starting point to get away from features and benefits and move towards you know, problem solving with you, but I'd rather have your take on this than. <laughs> no, no, this is all good. Well, look, you know, the, the, the advice I always give to founders and salespeople is I say, focus on the problem, not the product, like focus on the enemy of your customer and really understand what it is that they value. You know, this idea of value and return on investment is this concept that salespeople confuse and sales leaders confuse all the time. People don't buy things because of the return on investment. The return on investment, the, the purpose of a business case is to make your customer feel good about making that investment. But if I were to ask you, like, think about the things that you purchase in your life. What was the ROI of that round of golf that you did? What was the ROI of that last vacation? Why did you buy that car instead of that car? What was the ROI of that? And you'd probably have a hard time reconciling what the return on investment is, but you would probably say, well, I felt good about that round of golf or that trip or that car or whatever it is. Like you make yeah. these purchasing decisions. You buy into vendors because of the good that they do in the world and their mission and, and all of these things. And so I always say like lead with the feelings and the easiest way to lead with feelings is to pick the enemy of the customer. Of course, 
that requires you to, to number one, have a hypothesis about what the enemy is. And then hopefully you built your product or service around the fact that you were there to solve a problem for the customer. That's the thing that's going to resonate the most. Always start with the problem, but also appreciate the fact the thing that your customer values, the problem that they have might change over time. And it's funny. And I was, you know, as you were saying, we spoke a year ago and now we were at episode 55. Now we're at 110, which means you're you're doing approximately one episode a week. So, so I love the consistency. We're all almost 52 episodes later. You know, think about what was happening in the world a year ago. Like think about if you were, uh, let's say a purchasing manager at a hospital and you were in charge of buying like PPE protective equipment, what is it that you cared about? Well, let's rewind even a few months earlier, kind of pre-pandemic in North America, what did you care about? Well, look, you if you're buying PPE, you probably cared about price. Look, you know, I got, I got to make sure the price is good. Yep. The delivery schedule, like, look, it, when it gets here, it gets here. And quality, look, it's got to be good enough. That's it, right? Now, now a year ago when we, when we were doing our first episode, now we're in like the thick of the pandemic. You can't get PPE. What does your buyer care about? They don't care about money anymore. They're willing to spend whatever it takes to get this thing here yesterday. And by the way, it's gotta be super high quality. So I always think about number one, what is the problem that I'm helping solve for the customer? And how has that problem changed over time? Because if I created a business to sell PPE to hospitals a year ago, I would be leading with this, the concept of quality and speed and not price, right? Versus if it was two years ago, I'm leading with the, hey, look, we provide PPE at a fraction of the price to someone else, right? Like that's the, that's what we believe. So understand that leading with the enemy is really important, but those enemies might change over time. Yeah, no, I love that concept because I always do say, you know, what's the problem you're solving with the customer, how you do it differently. But I love, I think it's so much more easy to, to wrap it around is the enemy of your customer, right? If you can slay that dragon, what is it? Could it be time savings? It could be risk. It could be a, a hundred other things, but I think it's a great point, a great place to start is when you're building your business backwards. Because number one thing I tell founders is nobody cares about your tech and your specs. They don't care how you solve this problem. They want proof that it's going to be done, but the value, the trust, they, they're buying from a person, right? So you also have to be a bit unique too. Like for example, let's say I wanted to start a financial services firm. And I said, well, at Premier Financial, we provide world-class service for very low fees. Don't you hate paying high fees? you know, getting crappy service, we can help you with that. And you'd think to yourself, okay, well, that makes sense. Look, no one wants to pay more fees than they need to. But at the same time, like there's a million people that say that, you know, it's got to be a little bit unique and differentiated. So think about how not only are you going to lead with the enemy and what the customer values, but how you're going to sound different yeah. than everyone else in this, what I refer to in the book as the sea of sameness, when everyone has a solution that kind of sounds to your customers like yours. Yeah, no, I like it. I've used that same sound, the sea of sameness. It's, it's, it's so true. I had a, an author on a couple of weeks ago and basically he challenged me that said, Hey, if you have a great product or service, maybe the best, but nobody knows about it. Is it really the best? I'm like, Man, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and, but he's right. It's cutting through and, the noise and getting noticed. Right. And conversely, we've all had this experience of products that have great marketing, right. That aren't the best product. They just have really great marketing behind them. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? You know, because again, people don't buy the best things for them. They don't buy the best. They don't make the best decisions for them. They will always make decisions, however, that align with how they feel about something. So if there is a greater degree of emotional alignment, like think about like cars, there's like a million cars. And I might say like, what's the best car for you? Like, okay. If I was doing an analysis and saying, okay, a car that's like this, this big with this amount of power and this amount of off-road capability, I could probably zero in on that car for you. I'll, I'll tell you this really here. Here's a real life story. Okay. So we're in the pandemic and I have three kids and, and my wife and kids have been putting the hard sell on me to get a dog. Okay. And, okay. you know, and I'm not against dogs. I just don't, you know, I don't want to be in this position where like, look, who's going to end up taking care of the dog, right? If we, if we get the dog, I decided to like entertain my, my family. And I said, okay, well, let's, we first, if we're going to get the dog, we let's figure out, well, what kind of dog we should get. So what, what do you do? You go online and you, you, there's all these surveys, like which dog should I get? And they ask you all these questions. I don't want to offend anyone. They ask all these questions like, 
Do you want the dog to bark? Do you want it to be protective of the family? Do you want it to be independent? How many hours a day is it going to be by itself? What so how many pounds do you want it to grow to be? And they're asking all of these questions that to me seem quite reasonable. I'm like, oh, this is this is a very <laughs> thorough thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the end of the survey, it says, here is the 95% certainty. Here is the best dog for you based on, <laughs> on what you said. And it was this dog. And I don't want to offend anyone if, okay, I'll, you know, I'll, look, I'm not, I'm not here to, you know, offend dog owners. Facts are the facts. Um, fact, the, so the, the dog that it, it puts up for me is a dog I'd never heard of before. It was, it was called a Bedlington Terrier. And I looked at this dog and of course you do a Google search. And if you Google Bedlington Terrier, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the weirdest dog I've ever seen. I've never, <laughs> I've never heard of this dog before. Now, of course you see them groomed in all these kind of weird ways. I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, no, right? <laughs> and, but but the data and the science said that this was the best dog for like what, what I said. But then I had this emotional reaction, like, no. When I close my eyes and I picture my dog, I don't picture that, right? Yeah. And so what did we grab? So we ended up a week or so ago, we ended up getting a dog, long story short. And, and, and like, okay. Beddington Terrier. It, it was not that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was not that. And if you actually, if you go on my, uh, my Instagram cerebral selling, you'll see, uh, I, I posted a picture, uh, uh, of the dog, but like when I close my eyes and I picture a dog, like, okay, that's what I pictured. Like, that's what we would get. Right. And so back to this thing, like people don't yeah. buy the best things for them. The thing that they buy has to align with their mental image. So like, if you buy a dog or like you, you go to buy a car, you know, again, you might picture yourself driving a certain kind of car. And when advertisers, let's bring this back to sales and marketing, when advertisers show you the car in the context that you envision yourself, like for example, you see this car commercial, some, maybe it's geared towards, let's say a, a new person graduating college and it's their first car. And there's like a young, attractive person in the commercial throwing their musical instrument in the back of this thing and then going out to the country to go camping with this other attractive person. And you think to yourself like, yes, this is the thing that I want. And in fact, when advertisers advertise to consumers in that way, conversion rates increase because they're appealing to their emotional nature. That's not the best car for them, that's, yeah. you know, objectively speaking, but it aligned emotionally. And that's what we need to do as we're building our businesses as well. Especially in B2B. I don't, historically, we've never done that. I see collective we, that just wasn't the way it was done, right? It was problem solving if you're lucky, but it's more features and benefits. And here's the tool that you need to get to this point. And there's some probably some fear-based, man, if you don't get this CRM, it's going to cost you this much insurance or whatever it is. It was more along those lines, but I think you're right. The emotional piece of this, and I think uh, another stat they either heard you say or it was in your book, you know, that the customer only made the the right with air quotes or the correct purchase 20 to 40 percent based on what they truly needed in a solution or an offering, but it was a better fit for them emotionally or right along those lines. So right, don't connecting is so important, right? I think that's the, the bottom line is the human side of this, the emotion side of this, you guys can do it for sure. So, but, but take that to heart. And again, I know there's a couple of other pieces I want to touch on in our time because the two other pieces, the, the discovery, right. I think is, is so important because now you've, you got somebody to pick up the phone, whether you know them or not, this is your chance to ask the questions. And I think this comes back to helping you frame what you're doing, you know, with the messaging positioning, helping them see how this, this solution. So tips and recommendations, again, one read his book because it goes into detail and there's a lot of stories in that it'll be super helpful, but for the, the podcast sake today, what's a, a couple of your best practices for folks as they're thinking about discovery? Yeah. When I'll leave you with, with kind of two quick insights. The first one is thinking about what you want to talk about when you get on the discovery call, like how are you, what are you going to talk about such that the customer will feel that this was time well spent for them? So imagine like you go into Best Buy to buy a TV and you're looking to learn, like there's a million TVs there and you're looking to learn a little bit more about, you know, why this one versus that one. And so you ask the salesperson, can you tell me about these TVs? If all the salesperson did was start reading the little cards underneath the TV, this has got this many megahertz and this many pixels, you'd be like, I'm not an idiot. I could have read that. I want you to tell me what I can't see on those little cards. And so the idea is to think about what I refer to as the unknown, unspoken. These are problems, right? Pains, concerns that your customers have that you know they have because you're the doctor, right? You sell this stuff all the time. 
but they don't know they have. And so therefore they can't bring these things up to you, right? So through the discovery, the idea is if I'm going in and trying to do discovery on you trying to buy this TV, I'm going to ask you some questions, but also kind of geared towards uncovering some of these things that you don't know about. You have, have you ever thought about, you know, does your TV need to be outside and waterproof? And like, what kind of moisture do you have in your basement? Because this particular brand has been known to glitch out if it's in a basement that's kind of like higher moisture. And you might be like, oh, shoot. Yeah, I am putting this in my basement. Thank you for asking me that question. Right. So yeah, getting yeah. at kind of like the unknown unspoken, what that is for your customer. And it's going to be different for every company, every, you know, every business. Think about like what that unknown unspoken is. So that's number one. Number two is to think about how are you going to get someone to tell you something that they don't want to tell you? Like, think about like, if you have a secret, something you don't share with people, we all have secrets, right? If I put someone in front of you and I told you that this person was harboring a secret, just like yours, what would you do to get them to open up? Like it's that level of self-disclosure that we are trying to promote in the sales realm. Because again, like when you're in sales and you're in business, you're kind of unfortunately, the enemy to your customers. Yeah. They, they don't want to, they're always worried about when you ask them questions like, what's your budget? And who's going to sign this thing? And what does the process look like? And they think about like, why the hell is this person asking me that? And what are they going to do with the information once I give it to them? So there's all sorts of different tactics I cover in the book on discovery on how to do that. But one of the, I'll give you like the easiest one. And this is probably like one of the most versatile uh, tactics as far as the science of self-disclosure, which is if, from an empathetic perspective, if when you ask a question to your customer, they're always a little bit worried about why is this person asking, what are yeah, they going to do yeah, with the information? Yeah. You make them feel better by just appending your request for that information with the phrase, the reason I ask is because, and then you give them a good reason, right? So like, Brett, what's your budget for this, with your car shopping today? What's your budget, Brett? Because like, you're now you're thinking, hold on a second. If I, I want a low ball, because if I tell this person right. my real number, I mean, at so, a higher price. All right. That's right. So I might say, hey, look, you know, Brett, I'm just curious, what's your budget for, for cars? And the reason I ask is because we, we have cars at all different price ranges. And I, I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm showing you something that is in the range. I don't want you to think that you have to spend more than you, you know, originally thought. Like, that's the reason I'm asking. Right. The reason, you know, Brett, what does the signing process look like to get something like a deal like this done at your company? The reason I ask is because you mentioned that you wanted to be up and running and live with the solution in four weeks. And, you know, uh, I mean, look, to be honest, I've seen in some organizations like the signing process and the approval, it takes time. And I just want to make sure that we can meet your timeline. So th that's that's my my best and simplest discovery tactic. The reason no, I it, it, it's so true and so good because I think too often when we train our sales folks, it's the tactic without the why, right? So they're just following the blueprint of asking Bant, or I think you even showed the example of Medic, which are a couple mm -hmm. different types of discovery approaches. And it's got to be more human to human and conversational. And again, putting the, the customer to ease. So now that's fantastic. And, and last but not least, one of the top questions I get from founders is overcoming objections, right? <laughs> that is the number one, especially if you're not used to selling or haven't been in that says even our whole lives has been selling and you've overcome objections without even thinking about it. But I thought it was interesting from a statistical standpoint that the vast majority of times you lose a deal, no matter what you're selling, it's to do nothing, right? It's not to a competitor. It's really you're fighting the customer keeping, I think you call it the status quo, which is exactly, it's easier for me and less risky just to keep doing what I'm doing, even though, man, I do see what your product can do for me. So again, your, your couple of your best insights or, or tips on, on objection handling and, and how to approach that. For sure. So, you know, the, the first thing as I talk about with objection handling is, you know, number one, not all objections are meant to be overcome. You know, like I use this analogy of the 10 pound house cat that doesn't want to be held. You ever tried to hold a 10 pound house cat that doesn't want to be held? Like it just scrolls away. So not every objection is meant to be overcome. And, and I would submit to you that like not every customer is a good fit for your product. And so you shouldn't, your job shouldn't be to make sure that everyone was in a position to convert in your product or service. But as it relates to objection handling, one of the biggest pitfalls that people fall into is that we don't really end up handling, like we hear an objection and we want to respond, but we don't end up actually handling the root cause of that objection. And so the example I often give is when a customer says, uh, I like your product, but it's too expensive. And I say like, what is that? Like, what does that mean? Too expensive? Like right. think about all the different permutations of it's too expensive. Like 
for our budget, for the our priorities, for compared to what we're spending on this other thing. My buddy also works for this other company and I, I'm just going to buy from them anyway. So it doesn't really matter what the price is. Like if I ask you out on a date and you don't want to go with me, what are you going to say? You're like, oh, like, I'm busy. And I say, okay, well, what, Brett, what about next weekend? And you're like, oh, I'm busy then too. So like the whole, the whole problem with objections is that the things that people say aren't necessarily what the objection is all about. And so yeah. oftentimes we need to figure out, first of all, and uncover like what that objection is. And we do that by asking questions, right? One of the examples I would give to your specific objection around, you know, I don't, I don't know if it makes sense to, uh, to move forward. I, maybe we'll just stick with what we have, right? There's a tactic I cover in my book. It's called tactic number five. It's called consider the alternative. And this is actually, I, I hearken back to the people who remember this, the 1980 US presidential election, which was Ronald Reagan against Jimmy Carter. And Ronald Reagan comes in, he was trailing Carter going into the final debate it's funny, I'm a Canadian talking about U.S. You know, presidential <laughs> right. election. So he, he's trailing Carter going into the final debate. And in the final debate, he brings out, and, and Reagan, known as the great communicator, brings out this amazing tactic. And he, he thinks to himself, he's like, look, if I tell the American people that they are actually going to be better off with me, the fact that you know, the economy is in the crapper, security isn't as good, America isn't as respected, if you want this to be better, vote for me. He's like, if I try to strong arm people into that, like they're going to be resistant. Right. So what does he do? He uses his phrase. He says, people, American people, my fellow Americans, are you better off now than you are for, than you were four years ago? Like, think about this. If you're in the, he's like, next Tuesday is election day. You will stand there in the polling place and you're going to make a decision. I think it's well, if you may, when you're making that decision, ask yourself, am I better off now than I was four years ago? And then he goes on from there. And of course, he like a landslide victory in the election because people reconcile. They said, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm not better off. So the thing I would submit to you is if you are encountering a customer, the possibility of going with the status quo and just doing what they were doing before is very real. I think it's quite reasonable for you to ask during the discovery process, hey, look, you know, I know, you know we have a great solution and we think it could be a great fit for you. What you're doing today might also be okay, right? Like, do you think that if you just kept doing what you were doing today and you fast forward a year out, do you think it'll be fine. Like, do you think this problem will go away? Do you think it'll get worse? Do you think it'll get better? Like, I'm not in the business of spending your money. Like, I want to make sure you're comfortable that this is the right solution for you. So I might say, consider the alternative. Like, think about it. Like, if you don't do this, maybe this doesn't make sense. What would you do instead? Would it just be as just as easy to scale or grow or attract customers? That's the way I would think about it. And it's amazing because what you're doing is you're putting the burden of proof back on them to prove to themselves that they would be better off. And people like their ideas a lot more than they like your ideas. Yeah. And that's a good qualifier too, because if they come back and say, yeah, it's going to be just fine. You're going to have a hard time selling that person because they're not seeing the value of making the change, no matter how compelling you make it. I mean, you gave it your best shot, but there's just, you know, as the old adage, get to know quickly. Sometimes I'm not hundred percent in favor of that, but there's just a point that you're, there's just nothing you're going to be able to do to overcome that objection at this point in time. Say, you know what? No problem. We're here when you need us. This is how we can help you. And I think that's part of maybe the one last point we'll do before I do ask him one final question is, right, it's too often we have our salespeople tied to monthly and quarterly performance, right? So as they're doing outreach and they're selling customers, they need that deal more than the, the customer they're selling to needs your solution. And that doesn't build a good long-term pipeline, if you will. But again, sales reps don't always necessarily care about that, that pipeline. And so part of it is, and I've heard a stat, and I'd love to hear if you agree with it, that any given point between three and 8% of your target buying office or audience is actually in buy now mode, right? So it's like finding that needle in the haystack of folks. And I'm sure you can convert some folks, but Again, the longer play here is, hey, it's okay if they say no now. Just make sure you they're aware you're here when when they're ready. That makes sense. <laughs> it, look, you know what? This idea of like losing fast. I, I talk about it. I have an, an article on my website called "Win More by Losing Faster," and I actually have the data to back me up. Just from my own even personal experience back at Salesforce and my startups, like looking at the amount of time we spent in the discovery phase of deals that we ended up losing was way more than the deals we ended up winning. And we definitely don't want to spend time with customers that are not a good fit for us. At the same time, I totally agree with what you said, which was you know, this idea that not every customer is in the exact right buying zone for our solution. And in fact, uh, I talk about this in the book, and not that I, 
I want to find this, you know, in, in two seconds, but I do have a little image that I have around the buyer's journey. And the idea is our goal should not, here it is. So the goal you can see here, oh, yeah. The, yeah. the goal is not necessarily to, to align perfectly with the customer's journey, but rather to have our message in sales and marketing help shape that customer's journey so they align with our product and service. So that's part and parcel of when you lead with the, the mission, the emotion, the problem. When you do these things, you're shaping that journey of the customer. When you talk about the unknown unspoken, or like how do you get someone's attention? You have to tease the fact. It was actually interesting. I was talking to one of my clients today and she said, you know what I really loved? You wrote a LinkedIn post a couple of weeks ago. And she's like, I just want to tell you the thing that caught my eye was you start, the leading line was, I've been hearing this from sales leaders so much over the last few months. And then I continued and she was like, oh, am I missing something? Like, I, I want to know what these leaders are talking about because maybe, maybe I'm not thinking about this thing right now, right? So now all of a sudden I'm shaping her journey. So now she's thinking about the thing that I want her to think about, right? And not in a subversive way. It's just that customers walk around all the time with problems and pains that are latent, that are unspoken, that are unknown to them because they just don't have the bandwidth to focus on every possible eventual outcome in their business. And it's our job in, in a, in a, in, from the standpoint of caring and empathy to help shape that journey. Yeah. And sharing, right. I think it makes perfect sense. And just one last thing to tie off on the, the discovery piece. And I think again, either you had said it or I read it, that the, the amount of time spent on discovery on end up do nothing prospects is even like twice as long as losing to a competitor. So there's a lot of time wasted, maybe not wasted. If you use it effectively, it's not wasted, but lost in discovery of customers that aren't going to buy from you in the near future. And if it's in critical for you to get the short-term sale, man, learn to identify that sooner rather than later, you're going to spend your time in perpetual discovery. So excellent. All right, David, I know I'm, I've taken a lot of your time and we're short on time, but I do have to ask you the one final question, which is right now, as we are kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel, the, the pandemic here, what is one thing that, that you'd highly recommend? It could be either professional or personal or, you know, just what's top of mind for you right now? Like post-pandemic life? Or just in general, like as you're, you know, what are you doing today? Maybe to help you cope, get through it, or what's just one thing you would recommend uh, to other folks? Oh my goodness! It's been, look, it's been a long, it's been a long road. I'm grateful that a lot of companies are, are investing in uh, in sales training as a means to to get out there. Like my best advice is just remember to enjoy life. You know, I think we've been <laughs> we've been cooped up for far too long, and even the simple things. I often joke, I'm going on a North American hugging tour in the next little while. Just like I think. The contact with people is going to be the, the the best and most fun thing for me, like hugging people again, seeing people. And it's funny kind of hearing people who are a little bit further ahead of the curve than uh, than I am or you are, is that it can be a little actually quite exhausting to reintegrate <laughs> into normal yeah. society, right? It's like you don't realize how out of practice you are. You know, we've been wearing our sweatpants and hoodies and sitting in our basements and, and doing this stuff. So, you know, to get into it slowly, give yourself permission to kind of get, you know, get back into it slowly. But, you know, re remember what it is that makes us human and and embrace that. Like, let's not let's not get too comfortable sitting in our basements and, and kind of being reclusive. Like, let, let's get out there. I don't think a lot of people will need a ton of encouragement to do that. But know that you know it'll happen. It'll it'll just take time, and we will uh, we'll absolutely get there. It's all, almost like we're we're waking up from a slumber, and we're all kind of like oh, like well, you know, what's, what's this haze? We're all kind of reemerging from. But yeah, just just get out there, and I, I know we're going to snap back as a as a society. I a hundred percent agree yeah. with you, man. I think you know, just even a handshake, right? <laughs> you think about how long ago again vaccination rates are higher here in the U.S. right now, so we're seeing more of that. But man, you. Who would have thought, right? A hug for sure. Even a handshake with somebody you don't know is is something to look forward to. Someone, yeah. I'll tell you, someone shook my hand the other day. I was I was dropping my daughter off at her friend's house and uh, her father introduced himself to me and reached out to shake his hand. And I just, I just shook it instinctively. Mm -hmm. And then I came <laughs> home and I said, I told my wife, I'm like, he shook my hand. She's like, she shook, he shook your hand. Like, that's craziness. <laughs> like, what the hell is going on? 
But I tell you, like in the moment, it felt like the right thing to do. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> again, I think again, I'm a half full type of guy. So I think there's going to be a lot of good that comes out of the pandemic and the way people work and hopefully, right. Even though we have all been working from home and different people have different aspects of, of life, but you know, the one thing that I've, I've truly believe, and I was a commuter for a while that man, you take away 60 minutes, 45 minutes each way every day from somebody not going to that good luck trying to get them to re-embrace, you know, I'm going to the office five days a week and fighting traffic. And again, I don't think people are opposed to being in an office, but I'm not giving two hours of my life. I may be completely wrong. But I don't think so. <laughs> I think there's a lot of nuance and, and this might be a little, yeah. unpo- a bit of an unpopular viewpoint, but I feel like we're almost over rotating a little bit too much towards the virtual world. People are like, Oh, I'm, I'm much more productive. There's no commute. And for a lot of people like that, that's probably the case, but like, you can't just take the human interaction that you have on a daily basis from people that you work with and just move it virtually and not do anything. Right. to supplement it. You know, I think a lot comes from that human interaction. Even with me, it's funny, you know, working and, and now all my engagements are essentially on zoom, which has made me tremendously efficient because I roll out and I do this. And now I'm on with another client, but I miss taking the subway downtown and getting a Starbucks on the way and then running into someone like that's yeah. meaningful. Right. And especially with companies where you're hearing, Hey, look, I have a whole team I've never met in person before. And we're just going to keep progressing and pretend like virtual is the way to go, like forever and ever. Like, I think that's a mistake too. I, but I think we'll only know that in a couple of years. It's almost like the open office concept where everyone's like, oh, open offices, that's what we need. And then we realize like, oh shit, that was actually the worst thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're living in an ex- a science experiment. What can I say? I you're right. No, I'm super fascinated where it's going because I do one of the things, again, my non-expert opinion, right, that I have opinions is... Right. If, if folks that are working from home can supplement that, because right now they're working from home or remote, they can't even go to a coffee shop or meet with folks. Mm-hmm. But I think if you can supplement that human interaction and social with the network of people in your area that you want to work with and keep the job, because think about it, when you most of us in the corporate world, at least, and maybe not the startup world, we don't choose who our coworkers are. <laughs> sometimes we like them, sometimes we don't. But most of the time you go to the office, you interact, you come home. Where if, if it's the social aspect that people are missing, I think that can be supplemented. What, what I don't know is the value of that, you know, face-to-face interaction minus the inefficiencies of what the office, I don't know. We'll see. We're, we're living in a super interesting time. And to your point, time will tell. And we probably won't know for, you know, five years, more or less, you know, who, who's able to crack this code. So maybe there's some hybrid that ends up working, or there's just going to be companies that'll take the contrarian view and say, Hey, anybody that loves to work in an office, that's us, right? We're only going to recruit people that want to be in the office. Kudos to you. But then on the flip side, Hey, you want to be remote? We're going to hire the best remote people that we have for the thing. I don't know. I hear we could do a whole nother episode on this. So maybe we'll come back and read <laughs> in 52 episodes from now, we'll do a retrospective on uh, what exactly. happened over the last two years. Yeah. One thing that won't change is I think your approach to, to sales and growing revenue. I mean, I think, you know, it's science backed. It, it's like I said, I've, I've already said this during the podcast. I highly recommend you check this out because I do think it's a really good guide to help you improve closing those sales, having more conversations. And again, you can't argue with the data. So David, thank you very much for joining us again. I appreciate it. I always love our conversation. And like I said, maybe we won't make it another you know, 150 <laughs> episodes. We'll, we'll bring it back, you know, post pandemic when things are opened up and touch base with you again. Right on. No, look, Brett, pleasure being with you. Thanks for having me back. Looking forward to the next one. And lastly, I almost forgot to ask you the best place for people to find you if they, they want to learn more about you. Of course, we'll put in the show notes, but you know, what's the best way? Yeah. So my, my business and website, Instagram, YouTube channel are, are all cerebral selling. So uh, cerebral selling, you know, one word, Twitter as well. And the book is called Sell the Way You Buy and you can get it on Amazon. You, it's an audio book, a Kindle, wherever you buy books, you should be able to get it. Awesome. Thanks again, David. We'll talk to you soon. Pleasure, Brett. Cheers. Cheers.